Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Glad that you could join us. We're going to have a conversation with Mr. John Miller. He's president and founder of NOTA, N-O-T-A, and he's joining us on the program to talk about HT1 and also talk about a new update released by Sobe. Sobe is an international biopharmaceutical company regarding newborn screening for this very rare condition. Welcome to the program, John. Thanks for having me, Neil. Now, um, if you're president and founder of uh, NOTA, what is NOTA, N-O-T-A? NOTA is the Network of Tyrosinemia Advocates. It's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization based in the United States, um, serving the global tyrosinemia community. Um, there is approximately about 1,200 to 1,500 tyrosinemia patients, uh, HT1 patients in the, uh, in the world, and we represent about a third of them. Now, I understand this um, is uh, kind of a personal endeavor for you. Oh, yeah, very much so, yes. Yes. Um, this, is a, uh, this is nothing I signed up for. This is nothing I asked for. This, is a, this was a role that, that um, you know, I don't want to quote, uh, you know, J- uh, Jake and Elwood from Blues Brothers, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mission from God, you know? Yeah, yeah I get it. Now, a, a tyrosinemia, uh, hereditary tyrosinemia type 1, what is it? You say there are about 1,500 uh, or so patients that are, are dealing with this right now. What is it and who is at risk? So the, the disease, first of all, doesn't discriminate. It is, it is an autonomal recessive mm-hmm. genetic disorder where the body lacks an enzyme needed to break down protein. Uh, the liver cannot break down phenylalanine or tyrosine. Um, it, it, it affects one in 100,000 births in America, uh, roughly about the same um, in Canada, with the exception of one small region that's a much higher prevalence of the disease. Uh, and then beyond that, it's sporadic, you know, but throughout the world. It, there's, there's patients in America and Canada and Saudi Arabia and India and Africa. It doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. So um, every, I guess you could say everybody's at risk. <laughs> so this is something that is detected in um, shortly after birth during, during screening, or does it necessarily, um, is it necessarily screened for automatically? So historically, to do this in chronological order quickly, uh, in, before the discovery of succinyl acetone, the disease was, was only clinically diagnosed. Uh, it was discovered in the 1970s, and uh, it, it, was, you know, it was a fatal disease for infants. You either got a liver transplant or you, or, or, or you, or you died. That was pretty much it. And if you got a liver transplant, by the time they discovered the disease, you were in such a poor condition and especially also an infant um, that, you know, I don't know the specific statistics on this, but the, uh, the child would it just, it just wouldn't make it. It was very, very slim and none. So in 1991, they discovered um, NTBC, <clears throat> which is the, which is the product that, uh, that Sobe um, marketed for, for a number of years. And now and at this point in time, there's, you know, a couple other players involved, but they, uh, they're still the, uh, the largest uh, distributor of it in the world. And um, that drug is a life changer because we, when you take that drug, you can, um, you can, su- you can survive with, with the disorder. So when they diagnosed the, the baby, they would immediately put them on NTBC and then the child and the, you know, and the rest of the treatment, but the child had a chance at life. So now it's, uh, it's developing, but it's, it's not there yet. Is this something that's easily detectable? Is it something that can be misdiagnosed? As you say, you know, by the time they discover what it is, uh, the baby's in such bad shape, you know, needing a liver transplant, if it's even feasible to, to do that. What's the, the rate of misdiagnosis? Oh, very, 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 very. And that, that is the biggest issue. That's probably why we're on the phone today, Neil. The problem here is that when you diagnose the baby clinically, like you said, it's it's almost too late. And they... The states, the, the, let me rephrase this, the, the NHS, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my mind here. The NIH mm-hmm. has uh, mandated that every state in the United States test for sex, the presence of succinyl acetone in newborn screening. And by doing that, you detect 
CHT1 chemically. Mm -hmm. The states are not all doing that. And what happened with my son's instance, and this happens a lot, it's getting better as time goes by and the states are coming into compliance, but this is what happened to my son, is New Jersey at the time said that they were testing for tyrosine and they were not using succinylacetone. They were just testing for elevated levels of tyrosine, mm -hmm. which don't exactly show up on a, when a baby's first born. So when you have a baby who's clinically jaundiced, in the AFP level is 350,000 and the blood sugar is only 23 and there's projectile vomiting and the baby's <clears throat> on, on death doorstep. You don't know what's going on. You don't no, know where to begin. No, and no. You, you look at the newborn screening and you say, well, it's not maple syrup urine disease. It's not uh, tyrosinemia. You know, they checked for all these things. It can't be, we don't know what it is. And so it makes it exponentially more difficult to diagnose clinically. So this that, makes it more of a more of a sure shot uh, as far as screening. So what's the um, what's the problem with getting states to? Uh, is it because it's so rare that um, it's not getting the attention that it should? Uh, you know, um, that's the million dollar question. I've been doing advocacy for for newborn screening and tyrosinemia for almost a decade now, and. Every time I bring it up, I get promises that they're going to do it. I've gotten really good excuses like, you know, there's a new test coming out. There's a new machine coming out. We're waiting for it to be developed. But then I've gotten some really ridiculous explanations um, where one state told me they didn't have room on their table for the machine. And they needed to get a bigger facility before they could get the machine. And I'm like, seriously? Nobody's got a folding table anywhere around there. Or you, nobody's got an old computer cart. You can't put this thing on. You know, so it, it, it's amazing the, the, the variances. And for some reason, uh, you cannot get a straight answer out of these states. This is the big struggle that, that we've had for, for almost a decade is, you know, we've done, there's been, there's been studies done and we've gotten an answer. And in, in, in 2015, there were eight, eight states that were not in compliance according to all of our studies, right? And then now we, we, we partnered with Sobe to do an updated study on this. And guess what? We're down to four. But the four states that are listed are not the same states that we <laughs> had listed in 2015. It's, uh -huh. um, it, it's amazing. Like, you know, it, it's, it's especially offensive to me. I mean, it is a, I'm using that word, and I know it's a heavy word, but I'm, I, it is offensive to me that New Jersey, for example, is not in compliance because I'm from New Jersey. My son was born in New, in New Jersey in 2009. And when we had our daughter in 2015, we specifically called the newborn screening lab personally. And we were told, you know, we said, we want to know about tyrosinemia, this and that, and we want to know where you're at. And we want to know if we can get an extra test done or specific test done. And they said, Oh no, no, no. They said, um, you know, we said, because we had a child that had a misdiagnosis. And they said, 2009. And they knew exactly when it was. They knew that Evan was, was misdiagnosed. They yes. know that he almost lost his life. And they told us, don't worry about it. We're, we're testing properly now. <clears throat> and so we, we let New Jersey go. We let that go to bed. And I find out a couple months ago from this study that New Jersey's not in compliance. And they're, uh -huh. still, they're still not testing using succinylacetone. And I almost fell out of my chair when I heard that. It was like a shock because I do a lot of advocacy for New Jersey. I go to Rare Disease Day events, State House. I've done that for a decade and a decade wasted, Neil, because I could have I could have been advocating for this. And here I am smiling and kissing babies and, and, and talking to politicians about, you know, other good issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm being lied to. And that's the, and that's and that's really what had happened through when you call these newborn screening labs and it's not only tyrosinemia, it's these other diseases, they don't give you a straight answer. And depending on who you're talking to, you're not going to, you're not going to get the same answer. Twice. It, it, that's why this study was so important with Sobe because we hired professionals to go and do this. It wasn't phone calls. It wasn't, you know, uh, reaching out and, and grassroots. We hired a company to go out and get the bottom line. What's going on. And it was an extensive study that took almost a year, um, and, and, and 
you know, we, and we're, we're confident with the results and we believe now we have a real answer. And the good news is, Hey, 92% of the States are in compliance. That's great. I'm, That's I don't want to diminish that. That's phenomenal. Um, there are a lot of diseases out there that are not on the panel at all. And there are a lot of diseases, you know, that don't have a marker, you know, that they, they don't even know what their disease is, you know? So, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be too far down on it. I'm very fortunate for all the research and all the uh, resources available for HD1, but the bottom line is they are available and there is, there is testing available and it's just a matter of kind of check, mm-hmm. get the machine in there and save lives. It, it's so important. And, 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 the, and the remaining four states, they just, I don't know, they just don't seem to understand that yet. <clears throat> well, well, John, where, uh, where can our listeners go and get some more information about Sovi, about this study and about um, this, this update? Where can we go online and get some more information? So you can go to notacares.org, N-O-T-A-C-A-R-E-S.org. That's, uh, that's, that's Notus um, homepage, and there are links to everything uh, up on there uh, as well. So you guys, that'll redirect you to, to all, you know, what Note is about, and then you can get on to SOBI, and you can get through all this, uh, all, the, all this stuff. Well, I thank you for joining us on the program, John. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also uh, download and listen into this podcast on iTunes and be sure and visit our affiliates page at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. Thank you for listening to Health Professional Radio. We're very proud to be an independent broadcaster providing our content free of charge to you, the listener. One of the ways that we're able to remain free and independent is by having people like you become patrons. You can support Health Professional Radio simply by visiting hpr.fm and clicking the button that says Become a Patron. Your patronage of even just $1 a month lets us know that you're there, which in turn makes us more valuable to advertisers. And, of course, if you're able to afford more, then we would certainly appreciate the support. My name is Toby Longhurst from Health Professional Radio. Please visit hpr.fm, click the Become a Patron button, and support us if you can.